Welcome to the Good Food CFO Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Delavan, once again, joined by our producer, Chelsea Steer. Hey, Sarah, you are not the only CFO on the show today. It is true. I am joined by John Haskell on the show today. He's the founder of Ranch Right LLC. We know each other because we're actually working on a joint client right now. So John has a long history of working on ranches, helping ranches turn around like those that are struggling, making them profitable. He specializes in regenerative ranches, mm. farms and ranches that are good for the earth, good for people, good for the animals. It's really, really awesome. And he and I are working, as I mentioned, on a shared account where they have a ranch, but they also have a direct to consumer business where they're selling their products. And so it's been really fun to collaborate with him on this work. And we've gotten to know each other really well over the last six months. As you can imagine, we spend a lot of time on Zoom calls together. We spend a lot of time nerding out on <laughs> finance things. And recently... He invited me to talk to his team. They do these really cool like team meetings, I think a couple of times a month and they invite, you know, outside speakers to come. And so he asked me to come and there was a little bit of a Q&A. And one of the questions that came up was, is, you know, profit on the P&L more important than cash flow or vice versa? And it was really interesting because I had been having a conversation on the same topic with a client of mine. And you know that when something comes up and I hear it a couple of times, I want to bring it to the podcast and talk about it because if two people are thinking about it, lots of people are thinking about it. And I thought, what better than to have John join me and have this conversation because we had had such a great conversation about it with his team. And so you know, as, as with many things in finance, there's not a one size fits all answer or like a one size fits every business stage kind of answer. Yeah. Um, and so it was a really interesting conversation that I'm excited for people to hear. All right. Well, before we get to that, Sarah, do you know what time it is? Is it time for a review? It is. I love reviews. Yay. I love reviews. So this review actually comes from someone we know very well here at the Good Food CFO, Erica McKim. Oh, yes. She is the founder of And I Like It. Erica has been a supporter of the Good Food CFO for years now. She's one of our original sort of members of Office Hours as it was. You know, it's been many iterations over the years, and, and she's been here for all of them. She is a military veteran. She served for over 10 years in the U.S. Navy. She was deployed worldwide until she was medically retired from the Navy. And that's an important part of her story because it, it affected, you know, what she could eat and, and other parts of her life. And she went on to actually develop a proprietary all natural sweetener that has a low glycemic index value and really allows a lot of different types of people to eat sweets and to enjoy desserts and other mm. things in their life. So she actually sells those sweeteners. And then she has this delicious line of like keto friendly cheesecakes, fudge and other desserts that she sells at local markets and in retail stores. So just a little shout out for her business and for Erica. And so Erica's review is actually in reference to an episode that we did last season with Melissa Pacina from City Capital. Our second shout out for that episode. Yeah. So Erica says, Sarah, you have on the best guests. I learned so much and it reinforced what I've learned in your office hours. Thank you for all that you do. Hmm. I sort of don't know what to say. I mean, we obviously try to bring guests that we think are going to be helpful and informative and hopefully enjoyable, you know, for our listeners to hear. We try to do that with our news topics as well. And so hearing from you guys, our listeners, especially, you know, those of you that that we know really well, it's really meaningful to us. It it definitely does encourage us to keep on going and to to believe that we're on the right path and we're helping people. So that feels really great. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would echo that, Erica. Thank you so much for your kind words. I think everyone should go and check out And I Like It to see what she is up to. Okay. So a few weeks ago, we promised to follow up to our story about the Kroger Albertson's divestiture plan, right? And we wanted to give some more context to the conversation, provide a little bit more transparency on what it really means for Kroger and Albertsons as they push towards this merger. Yeah. And Sarah, before we get to that, I want to start out 
by pointing out that this merger, it doesn't just impact stores that have Kroger or Albertsons over the doors, right? Mm -hmm. Kroger and Albertsons both own multiple different brands under their umbrellas that target like different demographics in the market. So I went to both of their websites and I want to just list off for you the stores, the brands that they have under each of their umbrellas, and we'll see how many you recognize. So for Kroger, they list as their brands, Kroger, Ralph's, Fred Meyer, Dillon's, Smith's, King Supers, Fry's, QFC, City Market, Owens, JC, Payless, Bakers, Gerby's, Harris Teeter, Pick and Save, Metro Market, Mariano's, Food for Less, and Food Co. Okay. Then we go over to Albertson's website, and these are the brands that they have listed there. Albertson, Safeway, Vons, Jewel Osco, Shaw's, Acme, Tom Thumb, Randall's, United Supermarkets, Pavilions, Star Market, Hagen, Cars, King's Food Markets, and Balducci's Food Lovers Market. I don't know if everyone was doing this as you were reading those names, but I was sort of keeping track of which ones are near me, sort of near mm-hmm. near where I live. We have a Vons, a Pavilions, and a Ralph's that are literally all within walking distance. So right now they're owned by the two separate <laughs> corporations. If this merger passes, we'd essentially be shopping with one grocery corporation. So it's really interesting to see all of these brands laid out together. And I think you bring up, or this brings up a really interesting point that I just want to kind of make here. Something that's talked about in the book Barons, which I mentioned in last episode's nude segment as well. It is not uncommon in this ever consolidating food industry, like even beyond grocery, for a corporation to own brands across the entire, let's say, demographic of an industry, right? When we're talking about coffee, we're talking about retail grocery stores, like you name it, there are corporations that own pretty much all of the brands at every price point so that they essentially have ownership of the entire market. It exists to a certain degree now. This merger would make it even more so, right, in grocery. Yeah. And and on the surface, This divestiture, which we talked about right before, it looks like a good thing. Sure, because, well, let's refresh everyone's memory. The FTC required Albertsons and Kroger's to divest a certain number of stores. And then the Albertsons and Kroger team came back and said, you know what? We'll divest some more, right? Yeah. And so the initial reaction is, okay, good. They're getting rid of more stores. But we were sort of tipped off by by a news article that I saw that said, hey, 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 this could actually be a worse outcome for people and create less access to food in certain communities. And so that's why we're taking this deeper dive into what does the divestiture actually mean and how do they make these decisions of what they'll keep and what they'll give away. We're going to be pulling information from a specific article, which was one of the articles in, you know, that we included in our research for the last conversation. And we're going to link to that article again in the show notes. It's from the Seattle Times. But specifically in this article, we hear from Kevin Bowe, who is a mergers and acquisitions expert at the Foster School. He posits that one way to understand this divestiture list and what it really means is to consider how all of the stores on the list fall into one of four buckets. I think that this is so helpful. And I'm like, I'm so glad that this article was created because when we talk through what falls into each of these four buckets, the hope is, and and we'll do our best to make it clear why we believe and so many people believe that this divestiture is in fact not a great thing. So kick us off, Chelsea. What is bucket number one that they're looking at in this process? Yeah. So that first bucket is going to be the stores that the companies, Kroger and Albertsons, were basically forced to sell to satisfy regulators' concerns about the loss of competition 
in the area. Right. So for example, these are going to be like if there's a Safeway and then either right down the street or in the neighborhood or in the same even shopping center at times, maybe there's a Fred Meyer. Well, Safeway is Albertsons. Fred Meyer is Kroger. Under the merger, you no longer have competition in that community. Right. So they're forced to divest one of the stores and therefore, theoretically, competition moves in. Right. Yes. But as we pointed out in our last conversation, I would point out here that they are divesting these stores to CNS Wholesale, which Mm -hmm. under the condition that this merger is approved, they have already announced that the, I think it was the vice president of Albertsons would become the CEO and president of CNS. Yeah. Really important fact to remember here. Great. Yeah. Great point, Chelsea. So then we're going to move on to our second bucket. And Bo says that this bucket contains the locations that Kroger and Albertsons might have already been looking to offload, right? These are the locations that, for example, are either too close to a competing grocery store Or maybe they're really close to a hybrid retailer, like a Walmart that also sells groceries. It's really interesting. So here we've got a group of stores that the Albertsons and Kroger's were already looking to get rid of because of the existing competition in the area. And so, you know, one would say they're not really setting up CNS for success by giving them these stores. Yeah, but on the surface, the next bucket looks like they are trying to set up CNS for success, right? The third bucket, Bo says, contains the locations that CNS might actually have found especially attractive. These are the stores in upscale neighborhoods that have little nearby competition that maybe the current brand under Albertsons or Kroger is not really working, right? There's something about the location that it hasn't performed up to expectation. Something Bo speculates here is that these are high dollar locations where maybe the current store isn't working, you know, maybe the Safeway label isn't high end enough. And so CNS thinks it could be profitable, right, by upgrading the location to something more along the lines of a Met Market, a Whole Foods, a Sprouts, something like that. So this is a list of stores that not necessarily CNS for sure finds attractive, but that they might find attractive. Yeah. And then our fourth bucket, as Bo describes it, are the locations that actually are not on the list. These are the stores that for whatever reason, Kroger and Albertsons think will work best under their newly merged structure, right? Bo even points to a Safeway in Seattle, which has very little local competition. And it also has massive volume because it's right off of a major interstate. This he is citing as an example of the keepers for Kroger and Albertsons. These are like the in, the really incredibly performing stores where they just have a lock on the market. So let's recap these buckets here. So we've got stores that they have to get rid of, stores that they want to get rid of because it, there's high competition, stores they think that CNS could improve but would require an upgrade and sort of a, like a rebrand, obviously, mm-hmm. and the stores that they will keep. So let's zero in onto the second and the third buckets, right? High competition stores and stores that require investment and an upgrade. This confirms for me that CNS is not necessarily being set up for success and may struggle to operate its new stores. And as we said earlier, this creates a real concern that the result of this merger would look an awful lot like the results of the Albertsons Safeway merger of 2015. And to recap some of those stats, 30% of the stores that were divested in that merger were purchased back by Albertsons, some for as little as a dollar, and 
nearly 19% of the stores that were divested were closed permanently or converted to businesses that don't sell food. And in the, you know, the last time we talked about this, the, you know, a couple of episodes ago, we talked through the real human consequences, the areas, the people who were left without access to food with no grocery store for miles and miles. And so we're talking about this to create transparency, to create awareness. I don't know what we can do personally to prevent this merger from going through, but the FTC's case against the merger is heading to trial on August 26th in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And so we are definitely going to be following along. And as this story unfolds, we will continue to bring you any important updates here on the show. Yeah. In the meantime, we have what I think is a really great episode about how to look at the cash in your business, look at the profit in your business, know which of those two things to pay attention to when so that you can be successful in the long term, beat the, you know, the business failure stats that John is going to read you at the, at the top of the episode and be successful so that as regional food businesses, as, as small food businesses that are doing good by one another, right, by the land and by our customers, we can be successful and be around for a really long time. So Chelsea, I'm ready. Should we get to it? Let's do it. As a good food founder, do you ever feel like your work is done in a silo? Is it difficult to feel confident in your business and financial decisions because you don't have a sounding board? Well, in our weekly CFO office hours, you'll not only get the chance to work shoulder to shoulder with the Good Food CFO herself, Sarah Delavan, but also with a small group of your peers. Together, you can support each other through the work of building a business on your own terms. Passes are available now on our website. Just visit thegoodfoodcfo.com and click on services. And now back to the show. John, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you, Sarah. Glad to be here. Appreciate the uh, invitation and I'm honored to talk with you. Same, same. So as I said in the intro, you and I met working uh, on a, a joint client or working with a joint client. You have the CFO role. Uh, it is a ranching enterprise that also has a D to in it. And so it has given us the opportunity to bring our two backgrounds together and to work. And it's been one of my favorite parts of that project, as I know. Totally agree. You know, yeah, it's, it's really been cool. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about Ranch, right? And specifically the work that you do there. And then like, how did you, how did you end up in this position? I know you've got a background in ranching. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and I, I should mention right from the beginning, I have very little formal training in accounting and bookkeeping and all of the things that are consume a huge amount of my team's time. Uh, I come I come out of ranching. Uh, I actually uh, left ranching at one point to pursue something else and then found a way into what I what is called, you know, sort of holistic management movement, which is a very progressive movement in agriculture, whereby we focus on profit and sustainability and, and all kinds of, you know, multiple things at one time produces awesome results. I did turnaround projects for a number of years after learning the basics of what I think of as very good ranching that is both profitable and environmentally sustainable and, you know, good for animals, good for people, all that stuff. And we I launched from there into a career in turnarounds that was a lot of fun, but pretty stressful in our family. After Britt and I got married and started having kids, the idea of moving every couple of years to a new project and me being gone constantly sort of lost its appeal. She came yeah. up with a great alternative and really recognized the fact that the, the primary problem in most agricultural operations and really most small business is just bad financials. Nobody has good data about their business. Nobody understands how it performs. So by trying to bring financials to the forefront and make them both actionable and you know sort of presented in real time or what we talk about as being at the speed of commerce it gives people the ability to adjust and to course correct as they're going you know before disaster happens so we can yeah. get an idea that things aren't going the way we think they are we make a course correction and now we can get them to where we need them to be and in some cases it's it's better than that in some cases you know the business is going well but it could be going better but either way, you know, what we saw 
often is that most people don't have any kind of good financials until tax season, which is like a year and a half past the point where you can do anything about it. Yeah. So the idea was to bring them way forward in time so that we give our customers accurate, up-to-date financials every month so that they can see what's happening in the business and go forward from there. Yeah. One of our early conversations in, in starting our work together was looking at the PNL for, for the, the client that we're working on and saying, how can we make this better? What are we seeing here? And we talk a lot here about structuring your finances, particularly your, your profit and loss statement. So it's telling you something about your business, right? And as you're kind of hinting at, so you're not just using it for accounting and tax purposes, tax, but you can actually, yeah. yeah, use it as a tool, you know, for your business. Of course, there are those stubborn things that you have to kind of keep separate because gap accounting and blah, blah, blah. And so it's still not, you know, not perfect, but you can really, as you said, help a business see what's working, what's not, and, and sort of how to strategize going forward with a good set of financials. And the reason I asked you on the podcast, aside from the fact that I just love working with you and you and I can talk and have uh, for hours and hours and about finance. two nerds collide, <laughs> just yes. in case anybody's wondering. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, this topic of, or this question I should say of, is cash flow more important than profitability or vice versa has come up for both of us several times. And so I thought, let's get on the podcast and let's really talk about it. But before we really dig into that, I think it's helpful to share some business stats that you've pulled together. Good. So this comes, uh, actually, there are a couple of different sources for this, SBA and Forbes and a number of others. Uh, and I'm going to start backwards. But basically, 10 years in, if we look at the performance of small businesses, 10 years in, 70% of them have failed. There are different reasons why businesses fail, but overwhelmingly they do not fail because it's a bad idea or the person is incompetent. They fail because the business starves for cash. Yeah. Cash, I talk all the time, of, is like oxygen. You can go a little ways without it, but not very long. Yeah. Let's just run through these, though, in more detail. A lot of people have heard these stats. Michael Gerber in the e -Myth quotes them. Year one, 20 percent of businesses have failed. Year two, 30 percent. Year three, an additional 50 percent. Uh, that, those are pretty brutal numbers. Most yeah. people start with a good idea. They start with great intentions and they start with a tremendous amount of hard work and investment. And often a really great product. Let's just right. add that too. Right. There are lots of good ideas. Yeah. And oftentimes customers, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm thinking back and I've talked about it several times here, but my business, when it closed, we had repeat customers. We, you know what I mean? We were consistently selling our product, but that lack of cash was, you know, as you said, you can only go so long without it. So things can look really good from the outside and your business can be failing. Right. And, and one of the reasons I love this question that you and I both get is the answer is fairly complex, mm -hmm. but, but I think we could start with a strong bias, especially in an early phase of a business and in certain periods with, with one answer. And then maybe later it changes to something else. Yeah. They're, they're clearly linked together, but they are not the same. And I think one of the things that we see in our customers is a lack of understanding of how they differ. Those mm -hmm. of us that have worked in you know accounting and, and finance enough are clear about that, but that is not transparent necessarily to the rest of the world. And it's often not how we train people in the basics, which is yeah. really unfortunate. I think that's a really great point. There's a lack of, I guess, nuance perhaps is the right Correct. word in what we like to call around here, traditional business media. And one of the missions and, and things we strive to do is give our listeners the ability to do critical thinking about right. their specific business. So if we start at the beginning, we've got someone who has not launched a business yet, right? They're thinking about starting a company. They've got an amazing product. They've got some land maybe in your case, or are thinking about, you know, raising some animals. You have this two part question, I guess, that you like to pose when someone's thinking about starting a business. So I'd love for you to share that and then talk about, you know, are we focusing on cash here or are we focusing on profitability here? Because as you hinted at, both are significant and important and, and kind of what you focus on or what you look at changes throughout the life cycle of your business. So yeah. 
take us to the to the before you get started phase. You bet. So I, I want to generally look at financials under two main categories. And one is economic. Mm-hmm. And that asks a set of questions. And one is financial. Again, we the, the questions are related to the fact that every business is effectively a hypothesis and a set of tests. So each yep. each business is an experiment. The first question that is an economic question is, should we do this? Meaning, will people pay us for what it takes to assemble the product or gather that, you know, get the service done or whatever. Will they pay us enough to make it worth our while? Yeah. And that's kind of a high level question. That's a little theoretical, right? Can I, can I make a purse for less than I could sell it for? Right. Well, here's, here's, I don't, I don't know that it's hypothetical completely because we've run through this with people thinking about starting a business I'm thinking of one person in particular who has this idea that's really unique, so I cannot share the details. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. he came to us and he said, I have this idea and these are the inputs and here's who I would sell it to. And, you know, he had all of these things really well thought out and we ran the numbers, basically the cost, right? So the ingredients, the packaging, the labor. And here's the deal. We are absolutely running it with the numbers that would be the numbers day one. Because mm-hmm. you can't do the, you can't run the right. economics of the business based on what you think they're going to, it's going to cost in year five. Because right. what is it? 50% of businesses aren't going to make it that long. Right. You're not going to get there anyway. So. Right. <laughs> so when we ran the numbers on with, with this beginning, it was like, okay, the product, whatever, you know, what I can't say again, what it was, you would have had to sell it at retail for $25. And mm-hmm. when you compared across mm-hmm. the shelf, if you will, you know that no one is going to pay that. So to right. answer that question, right, you go, No, right now in this way that we're thinking about doing it, we can't produce this and sell it at a price that people are willing to pay for that would actually work for us. And so that that's sort of tier one of the question, because if the answer is, you know, if the answer is, man, I could make an incredible oil filter for fifteen hundred dollars. Like, well, a regular oil filter sells for seven. Like who's going to pay me an extra fourteen hundred and ninety three dollars for a really good oil filter? Probably right. nobody, right? Yeah. So, so that's sort of cut one, and I want to I want to emphasize that while I say this is what we talk about at the startup, these are questions that we're asking ourselves constantly, month yeah. by month, as we go through the business. So, yes, you don't use hypothetical numbers from year five, but we are always reevaluating because yep. the cost of inputs changes, the cost of fuel changes, the cost of labor changes, all those things. Yep. Okay, so so that so that's can we do it? Is this enterprise worthwhile? Is it something people will pay us for? Are there customers? You know, those sort of big picture type questions. So that's economics. The next mm-hmm. set is financial. These are finance questions and finance is entirely concerned with how do we pay for it yep. or how do we make it work? And there are also logistical things that I would like people to think about here, right? We have to, time becomes a very important dimension in our life here. Can we get things to arrive at a reasonable time? How long does it take between the time I have to pay for my materials and the time I receive money from the customers? What What is the time on maybe any borrowed money that I have, that sort of thing. Yeah. But that can we do it question, those are finance questions. And when we look at something like a balance sheet, right? A balance sheet is sort of a snapshot in time and a P&L is a, a profit and loss statement is kind of the movie version. Mm-hmm. We have to even go one step further to have the cash flow to understand like, am I going to run out of oxygen before I get to the finish line? Yeah. The way I like to ask that question is how, like, how long is it going to take me to have a profitable business essentially, right? Reach that sort of break even point and how much money is it going to take me to get there. So that's that, yeah, like that time. And then do we have the money to do it? Because it takes money to grow. It takes money to establish the business. And something that we say a lot here is like, when the day you start the business, you're in debt. That business is in debt because it does not inherently have money, right? So, yeah. so all of those realities that you've said this recently is part of this is making sure we don't lie to ourselves right? And being That's really right. honest with right. ourselves about what this is going to take financially to you've work. Probably, you've probably heard the saying, there are lies, damn lies, and then there's accounting, right? The, the, <laughs> the, real, the real goal of managerial <laughs> accounting, which may be a little different than your tax accounting, is to get an honest picture to yourself of what's going on. Yeah. In our hypothesis testing, it is an attempt to be as honest as we can, right? In mm-hmm. the same way that science is, right? You can lie with statistics, you can lie with experimental methods, Mm-hmm. Uh, but the goal is to try not to fool ourselves into doing something foolish. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think too, something that's important to point out here is that you're never going to be a hundred percent right because this is a forecast, right? Correct. The initial economics that you're creating for your business and for your product, you're taking best guesses, educated information, right? Like research that you've done and you're putting that together and sort of creating that economic model to mm -hmm. make a decision. You're doing the same thing with this cash flow projection or this cash projection is saying, here's what I believe I'm going to need. I'm being as brutally honest as my, with myself as I possibly can. You and I, I believe are on the same page with always going with a little bit worst case scenario yeah. Yeah. to protect yourself. Your, was it your dad that said... So, he had yes. some really good advice. Yeah, he, di he did. And funny enough, my dad is here visiting at my house this week. So it's been fun. We've revisited a few of these things. But uh, when I started my first business 25-ish years ago, my dad said, take your, ex your estimate of your expenses and add 25% to it. Take your estimate of your income and subtract 25% of it. And then take any time estimate that you have and double it. Right. And if that says that you will be profitable, you should definitely do it. Now, right. there were some other cases where I was like, eh, maybe there's some gray area, but that, but the first year, funny enough, when I ran that business, I made about $10 because as it turns out, my cost overruns were about 20, they were like 24 and a half percent. And my income uh, underruns, if you will, were right, right. at 25%. And turns out it took a lot longer to get customers to pay than I thought it would. And I squeaked by. I did not go into any debt. I, we were we were net zero, basically, for the first year, which to me was a huge win. Yeah. Because year two, we had refined everything. Now we were significantly profitable already in year two. But what we often see is we make these great, really best case estimates. We're very optimistic, right? We, mm -hmm. we just tend that way. That's why we're entrepreneurs. That's why yep. we start businesses, right? You're, if you're a pessimist and always down in the mud, like you're not starting a business, right? Mm -hmm. But if you take your natural optimism and temper it with some real world, and, and my father's been a business owner multiple times for all, you know, all of his working life. If we know that we're optimists and we temper that with some just, you know, kind of arbitrary numbers and it still works, that gives us the best chance of actually achieving success. Yeah. So if the numbers are looking good in our, in our initial estimates and when we're asking ourselves these questions and we decide to go ahead and launch the business it's unlikely that you're going to be profitable in most cases in year one, because there's Correct. a lot of things you just don't know, right? Your forecasts are not going to be accurate. They're, they're probably going to be somewhere around, you know, your dad's guidelines. And so, you know, the first thing I want to say here is that we're not paying attention to profit in terms of that net income on the PNL in year one, right? right? In month one, month two, month three, we're not paying not attention to that, but yeah. we are paying attention to the economics, right? of the product and of the business. And, and I'm going to say we're definitely looking at that gross profit margin, right? Correct. Because if our business is not producing a positive gross profit margin, we really can't be successful. That's sort of Correct. like mission critical number one. Once we've secured the cash we need to go as long as we believe we need to go, well, I think once we're operating the business, we need to see that gross profit in order to know that, okay, the the economics of this product and of this business have a have an opportunity to work or not, right? Okay, can we can we jump in with a definition here real quickly yeah, to make sure, sure we're all on the same page? So revenue minus our direct costs. So direct costs or costs we use it as costs of goods sold in in QuickBooks yep. because of the behavior of the software, not because of the tax definition. But those yep. are things that change one for one. So if I'm going to sell a set of sunglasses, I have a cost of goods sold that is the price of producing one pair of sunglasses, which I then sell. If it, I, it is very possible that I can have a very good gross profit at the beginning of a business and be, be not anywhere close to profitable because mm -hmm. I don't have enough volume yet to cover all of my overheads. Yep, exactly. Gross profit is the money that then is left over after your direct costs are paid to pay overheads. Overheads are those fixed costs. We talk about them as admin, land, labor, and, and like equipment, PPE, right? Property, plan, equipment. It takes a while to build a business to the point where it covers all of those overheads. But if we have strong gross profit numbers, that is a go signal, right? That is a yes, this is working. Let's go. Now, if I produce a set of sunglasses that I sell for $5 and it costs me $10 to make them, I have a bad gross profit. Yeah. I don't, I'm not going to put my foot to the floor on that, right? That I'm going to go broke faster. But if I have a set of sunglasses that I sell for $10 and it costs me $3 to produce them, 
that's now a you know 70% profit margin, gross profit margin or gross margin sometimes called. And I am going to put my foot to the floor with that one because I have lots of money left over to pay my overheads. That gross margin, as we talk about, is a measure of efficiency of that enterprise. The more, if you think about it like a funnel, when I put more money in the top, you know, some of it gets winnowed out along the way, but I want more to come out the bottom, right? Yeah. Ultimately, the bottom goes into my pocket, but initially I just need to get my overheads covered first. Yeah. And I also want to add a little bit of nuance here too, right? Because it's, we can't just say, and, and basically I'm just drilling in to make this crystal clear yeah. for people. If you made that pair of sunglasses or a cake or whatever it is, right? And it costs you $3 to make and you sold it for four, mm -hmm. it's technically still profitable but it is not profitable enough, mm. right? When you've got the, when your margin is smaller and we like to pick on 50% as like the, you know, that line that we like to, to draw in the sand. If we're sub 50%, we know that it's going to take more cash for us to, right, to get to profitability. We know that there's going to be some additional investment needs or cash needs to produce more product. Yeah. Whereas if you're above 50 and I love that 70% gross margin, it's, it's less of a strain yep. on your cash as you're selling and growing. So you want to be aware of not just if it's a, if it's profitable and if it's positive, but by how much and what that percentage is. Yep. And I think you bring up a great point because when we're launching a business, we're essentially in a growth phase. And by definition, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. And typically, it takes a I would say a couple of years generally, right? To get enough volume in your sales, not always, but I think, but I think if we're talking in generalities here, a year or two, if not more to get your revenues high enough to produce that profit on the bottom line. Yep. And I would argue that if we're not profitable on the bottom line, that our cash flows are what we would call negative. Would yep. you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll add some stats to that. I think in general, a good business with a good business model that the lion's share of time it takes three years to get to what i think of as true profitability mm -hmm. now we can squeak through and i've learned some things and i'm sure you have too running different businesses over time i can get myself to a point where i'm not bleeding cash yeah. almost right out the gate yep and there are some things you know we can take some prepayments we can structure some things you know correctly to get to that point and even in the businesses i've done where i'm positive cash flow right from the get-go around the time we hit year three we have streamlined our systems we've developed a process we have a product pipeline we have a customer pipeline year three we're hitting it and that's where we suddenly see like oh now not only are we just technically profitable now we're hitting our actual profit targets yeah so we've talked about sort of those business economics that we're looking at from launch, right? And so the gross margin and things like that. But we're also absolutely looking at cash. Can you talk a little bit about how are we monitoring our cash in what we're calling the initial growth phase of the business? Perfect. Okay. So I mentioned early and, and uh, we can debate the exact terminology. The economics are kind of theory, right? Mm -hmm. The great thing about the finance side or the cash side is ultimately money is going in and out of our banking account, right? We have established a checking account for the business yeah. and either that uh, the amount in, you know, we might put 10,000 in it to get started. We might put 100,000 in to get started. Ultimately, that cash is either increase or, or decreasing. Hopefully there's some coming in and some going out. We know there's some going out right at the beginning, but hopefully we're getting that, you know, sort of close enough in time that those are becoming an exchange. Yep. The cash flow part of this is the part that, like I say, this is why most businesses fail. And the reason they fail is because we fail to sort of sit down and fully count it all the way through. We talked about the, the estimates that we get wrong, but there are also lots of things that we just don't think thoroughly enough mm -hmm. through. So when we sit down and draw it out, like, okay, the first month I have to, I'm going to pay myself $3,000 a month to work in this business. All right. So I got negative 3000 and I've, and I've got this fancy office that I rent from myself. <laughs> right. So there's, there's $500 a month. And then I've got a fuel that I've got to put in my vehicle to make deliveries or, or, you know, I've got to buy software for my computer. I got to buy the computer, right? There are all mm -hmm. those things. Now buying a computer or buying a vehicle is interesting because those are actually capital costs. Okay. Capital costs don't show up on our P and L. Yep. Uh, as do principal payments on loans. So if I right. borrow money, that does not show up on our P&L. 
But if I take a loan, that obviously could have a positive impact on my cash flow initially, mm -hmm. right? So I take a $10,000 loan to start my business. That puts $10,000 in my account. No economic value has been created, but a $10,000 you know, transfer has occurred. Mm -hmm. But then that obviously has an impact on the opposite side when I have to start paying that back. So I sell my first set of sunglasses. Well, now I've got to make a thousand dollar payment on my first ten thousand dollar loan. Like yep. well, that's a rough, you know. I, I am starting out behind. As you mentioned, we are always starting behind, right? Mm -hmm. We always have a beginning set of numbers where we go, I believe it's going to cost me $3 to make this thing. There's always, you know, labor is 68 cents per unit. And right. The reality of that is I would say at least 90% of the time different than what you have on that piece of paper 100%. or that Excel spreadsheet when it hits your PL, right? If you're at 90%, you're so much better than I am. Yeah. Sarah, that's... <laughs> so, I mean, we try to build our models to go, okay, that's what you're doing on this like very, you know, specific level of this much labor and this much of packaging and all of these things. But in reality, uh, your production team is probably going to work 40 hours a week or right. Yeah. And they might yeah. not produce as many units per hour as you think that they are. So yeah. We could kind of take that and then model. But one of the things we're doing is checking to see how far off from that economic yep. projection right. we are to correct in addition to looking at that that gross margin number. Yep. So that was something on my mind that I wanted to add. But when going back to cash flow, when we start out with a cash projection and we have this idea of how long our cash is going to last and how far into the business it's going to get us, one of the things that we should be looking at is something called burn rate. Mm -hmm. And so can you define that for us, John, and let people know? I think it's a very like um, popular word that people hear a lot, but they might not necessarily know what the heck that actually means. I'm glad to hear people hear it a lot. I, <laughs> when we talk with people about it, they're like, nope, never heard of that. So anyway, it, it is literally just, we're going to, some people, there are lots of different ways to talk about it, but it is, to me, it is, what does it cost to keep the doors open and the lights on? Yeah. So the most basic cost of running the business we can do this a couple different ways. I prefer to be more conservative about it. So I will use the overhead costs plus debt service, mm -hmm. and then I will add the direct cost to that. I think that's smart. And then take that for a year and then divide by 365 days. And you have an estimate of what does it cost per day to run your business? The fun thing is if you play with the math around 365, it doesn't take very much to get to, it costs a thousand dollars a day, $2,000 right. a day, $5,000 a day, just to keep the doors open, right? This isn't, you haven't made anything, right? You haven't, you haven't done much. You've just gotten by. And I, the reason I love that number, I just presented that number with a client we've worked with for a while this morning. And we've talked about this number multiple times with them. They've gone through some change. So their burn rate has changed almost always people gasp when you give them that number. Like, there's no way it costs that much. Like, mm, it does. Yeah. And the, the thing that we add that I have become very focused on over time is what are the other unpaid costs? So if you as the owner are investing a ton of time and not paying yourself, mm. if you are renting, in our case, often land from ourselves, right, yeah. in a ranch business and not paying yourself, if, you know, I, I work in an office that is a, a building, you know, that by my house, right? A shop out back of my house. So again, I, I pay a rent at, to myself on paper, right? When I right. do my burn rate calculation. Now, some months I don't have the money to pay the actual rent. And since I'm the landlord, I can be fairly forgiving. <laughs> but but my, again, this is the lying to yourself, right? Yeah. I don't I don't make that number go away because I can't pay it. I just say, ah, I need to do $500 better next month in order to cover that. I think that's a really good thing to add to the conversation because, yeah, we have founders all of the time who say, well, I'm, I'm the one producing the product, but I'm not paying myself. And the expectation is that I won't. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But when we're running the numbers, when we're calculating things like that burn rate and how much cash do we need, we need to factor in what you should be paying yourself, right? Correct. What your time is worth. And so putting that into your calculations, I think is a really great idea. I want to share a client scenario situation, real life that I think is might kind of drive this part home about the growth phase and the difference between profitability and cash flow and particularly with debt repayments, right? Mm. So it was just creating a growth plan for a client, which we do for about five years out. 
okay? They're thinking about launching into distribution with a series of regional distributors. And so we're focusing first on one region. And we ran the numbers with basically, you know, okay, what if we get to a thousand stores? What if we get to 2000 stores? What if we get to 3000 stores? And what we found is that 2000 stores was that break even point where the business is profitable. So if mm -hmm. we looked on the PNL, the mm -hmm. business would be showing profit. But what we're also seeing is that despite that profitability and because of the loan repayments, it makes this even more significant, the cash flow. So, so I should say this, but in one scenario, if we were to hit 2000 stores by the end of 2025, mm -hmm. okay, which is very soon, yeah. the cash flow would not be positive till the end of year five. Mm -hmm. So profitable on the PL, yeah. you would see it for three years yeah. before you would be cash flow positive. But here's the kicker there would be more debt needed than what they were currently paying for. So it, so it's this kind of ongoing thing. Yeah. This is the difference between launching into something with your eyes closed and launching into something with your eyes wide open. Because we're talking about like $1.5 million over five years of cash needed mm -hmm. to potentially get to cash flow positive. Mm -hmm. That's massive. Yep. And you need to know where that money is going to come from, in my opinion, before you start, because you don't want to get halfway there and run out of money because then you're a business that has failed. You're in the, you're in the 70%. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good. Let, I, I, I want to make a quick analog here because I think sure. your eyes wide open is, is really important. If I know I have to hold my breath for about 15 seconds longer than I can comfortably hold my breath, mm -hmm. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. If I find myself 15 seconds past holding my breath for a comfortable period of time and I don't know where that's going to end, I have a real mental problem. Right. Yeah. I have just tremendous distress. So I can endure a lot of things if I know where the end is. Yeah. If I have no idea where the end is or I fooled myself into thinking it's coming and then it doesn't come and then it doesn't come and then it doesn't come, that causes a lot of heartache. And a lot of debt. Oh, man. Right? <laughs> and trying to get debt at a time when you, when you're really a terrible, uh, you know, you look Candidate bad on paper, it. right? Yeah. Right. yeah. This is a and if you've worked this out ahead of time with the bank, they understand it. There's a plan like, yep, we're, yep. we're continuing to draw this down, but this is all part of the plan. That's great. If you're yep. halfway through it and it's this like, oh, crap moment, I'm in trouble. I really need money. You yep. got a problem because the bank yeah. can smell you from a mile away. Yeah. And I think this, that what you're, you're, you're describing something. It's so important because when you don't know if success, if, if being able to breathe is a week away, a month away, or a year away, sometimes people will go, well, I'm just going to try to hold a little bit longer. Yeah. I'm just going to try to hold a little bit longer. And you end up in a much worse situation financially than if you said, you know what? I know that I'm at least a year out and I don't, I'd yeah. rather cut my losses now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I also want to say that like, it's okay. They, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, they don't all work. <laughs> they don't, they don't all work. And even the best laid plans, things happen in the economy. Things happen in just the consumer landscape. Like it, the, it, the rain, right? COVID. I, I, COVID, like it just, these things that are out of your control. Yeah. And so there's no, I want to be clear that there's no negativity in deciding to yep. stop or having to stop for a financial or other, you know, life reason. But if you want to keep going, then these things we're talking about, I hope will help you keep going. Yeah. The other part is if you have partners, if you have a spouse, if you have investors, same exact thing, yeah. right? I, my, my accounting mentor talks often about this sort of pillow talk that goes on between the business owner and his or her spouse. And he's not trying to be weird about it, but just that there, <laughs> we, we have this in our house, right? Our kids go to bed at 730. My wife and I can generally stay conscious for 30 minutes to an hour after that. Okay. <laughs> it's not our highest quality brain time, but it's a good time for us to just visit. And that is when my wife's concerns about, hey, I noticed our checking accounts kind of thin, like, well, yeah, yeah, it, it is right now, but it's, you know, we're, here's why and here's where we're going to be. Yeah. As opposed to like, huh, yeah, yeah, I didn't notice I that. I know, yeah. Huh. <laughs> or I and know, it, let's change the subject. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh. Oh, boy, yeah, I'm tired. So tired yeah. <laughs> 
but it uh, but it's the same with investors. And it, and again, I really want to reemphasize this point that that uh, and and it comes up a lot. A, a wonderful book I've been rereading has been Made in America by Sam Walton, mm. uh, or or made it's Sam Walton Made in America. I think there's a co-author or something, right? But it, he goes through in great detail the growth that Walmart went through starting in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And of course, he got to exactly this point where they were incredibly profitable. It was a wildly successful store. And yet he was constantly running out of cash. And he was basically going from one lender saying, hey, we need a million bucks. And they'd say, eh, maybe, okay, yeah, we can do that. And then as soon as he got that million dollars, they were growing so fast, they were basically out of it again. And they needed right. another million. And then, but you know, you do that a certain number of times and the, the, about the fifth bank in line is like, what's going on here? This starts to look, you know, now again, it was a great plan, but the reason why Walmart went public is because Sam Walton had amassed, you know, two or $3 million in personal debt. Mm. Uh, they were continuing to open stores that were very profitable, but the cash suck on the overall system was just incredible. And I think he talked about a breakover point where they were at a hundred stores ish. And I'm not going to remember that number, but there's some very large number of stores where now they could much more easily finance the opening of new stores. Right. And I think you talked about an example of a company in your space that had some significant financial troubles here recently. And, and again, from an outsider's view, it sounded like, man, we were just, they were just growing themselves out of cash and nobody was realizing what the cause of the underlying problem was. So it, you, you once again have created an amazing segue because there's this idea of what I'm calling a, a plateau, right? A business plateau. I think that that makes sense. I think that term has been used before and it's where we're sort of halting the growth, right? Using the example of 2000 stores for mm -hmm. this you know, client that I just mentioned, there's a reason that we would be stopping at 2000 stores in this case and essentially plateauing. And, and, and we actually need to revisit the numbers and we might have to go up to 2,500 stores, right? We're still in the progress of, of analyzing and, and making some decisions here. But when we reach the point where we can get to cash flow positive, mm -hmm. right? And profitability, we want to stay there for a bit. Mm -hmm. And the reasons we would stay there would be to build back up our cash reserve. So again, kind of like saying, hey, you know, traditional business media, we know that growth is really exciting. We know that being a national brand is something that, you know, people love the idea of. But when you are just constantly growing, especially if you're doing it in retail, you are just piling and piling and piling money into free fills and ad spend and all of these things, right? And if you go, okay, here's this point where I want to pause and generate cash and mm -hmm. really mine the business that I have, right? Mm -hmm. And make it really, really successful because A, you're going to build up your cash reserves and B, you're going to get some really good data mm -hmm. to potentially set yourself up for you know, better deals, right? As you're approaching additional growth, but also going back to what you said earlier, John, you can continue to look at the business economics and go, okay, can we refine this? Are we at a state we've been so focused on growth? Is there anything we can do internally to make the economics of our business even better? Yeah. Right. And boost that, yep. that cash influx yep. that we would love to have right now. Love it. When we are looking at especially a rapid growing business, there is often a data distortion. It is mm. really easy under growth. And, and sometimes we, we, for example, in our business charge an onboarding fee. So and one of the reasons we do that is for cash flow. But yep. that onboarding fee can often distort our numbers. So when we go through a period of rapid growth, we collect a lot of these onboarding fees. Well, those are those like those are income that aren't going to exist when the business stabilizes. And I have seen lots of cases where people have figured out like, oh, I can charge in advance or I can bring in prepayments. I can I can do some pre-selling and maybe even some things with financing and investors where it looks like we're doing OK, but maybe the underlying business. Not be OK. Mm -hmm. Gro growth is incredibly dangerous for many reasons. I've repeated this lots of times. It is, you know, it is like a chainsaw. It will cut your leg off or it will get you where you want to be. But it is it is very yeah. dangerous. And I think just like being in a car that's going very fast or accelerating very quickly. Right. If my kid's in the back seat and we're merging onto the highway, how fast are we going? Well, by the time she asks that, I answer it and she hears it. 
now the answer is wrong, right? We're now at a different speed. Well, now she asks it again. Well, we have that conversation back and forth. It's the same in the financials. If we assume at best a 30 day lag in a rapidly growing company, sometimes 30 days, every, everything is different again, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we want, yeah. we want to be very, very careful with that. But, but I agree, we often sometimes need to get to periods where we want to rest. And the other thing we see with business leaders and, and the whole, all the people in the business, when we are in rapid growth, especially in a startup type environment, mm -hmm. we live in chaos. I am very thankful for our team members who put up with my crap uh, and are willing to sort of cover me when they need to. Because as we are growing, there there's always unexpected stuff. They are always dealing with that. Well, every now and then, and we're in a season of this right now, onboarding is slower. Growth peels way back for a minute. We all kind of get our breath together. We reevaluate, just like you're saying, you know, what are the processes we can improve? Where are we, where are we leaking? Where are we over? But also we rest, right? And yeah. then by the time the first of the year comes around, we're going to be back with our foot mashed to the floor and and the stress begins again and i i don't want that to just be a constant process i want i there needs to be some ebb and flow in that yeah and i think you know so when we're thinking about a business that's operating year round and can theoretically have you know growth and continued sales nonstop sort of 12 months throughout the year electing to stop the growth mm -hmm. and do this sort of internal work before mm -hmm. you then, you know, try to grow again, growth costs money, right? This idea of scaling. And I've talked about this before in <laughs> a CPG brand specifically, and I don't quite know what it's like in, in ranching, John, I know that there's limitations on how much land you have, right. And how much, how much cattle, for example, you could raise on a piece of land. You could, you're, so you could scale that land to a certain degree, and then eventually you're going to have to buy more land mm -hmm. if you want to, right? And I consider that growth, mm -hmm. right? When you're bought, put, spending more money on inputs, yep. that's growth. Yep. And so when we're growing, we're spending, we're spending, we're spending, we're spending. We can plateau that in terms of that spending, in terms of the, the number of new stores we're opening, doesn't mean that our revenue slows down, yep. doesn't mean that our revenue even stays consistent necessarily, right. but it means we're not investing yep. heavily in the growth yep. and we're trying to build up those cash reserves. This also happens kind of naturally in a seasonal business yes. as well, yep. right? So we could talk about, and I'm sure this happens in ranching. I mean, you, you, an animal takes time to grow right. <laughs> right before it can turn into a product that is purchasable right. in, in the many different ways that it is. In a seasonal business, we know that there are going to be a month or months or periods of the year where we're not going to be generating enough revenue. Yep to be profitable, yep. right? And it's it's sort of like a built-in, I don't even want to say a plateau, it's a dip in this case. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is another time where you say, well, what's important here? We're, oh, oh, we're not profitable during these months. No, you're not. And you never will be because you're a seasonal business, yep. right? There's just for, for, you know, in, in some cases. And so what you do is you make sure that you've built up enough cash reserve so that you can make it through this season and you utilize this time to say, what did we do well mm -hmm. during the peak last time? What can we improve on? What are the economics of the business? So, so even still, you're looking at both of those things, the, the, the P and L, the economics of the business and the cash to, to go, how can we do better in the future? And where are we? And are we in a safe place and all of those yep. types of things? Absolutely. One of, one of the greatest things about farming is it's, it provides, and, and, and ranching is the same, but farming's a little better. Uh, provides so many great metaphors for life and for business. And we, we talk often in my training that I do, I talk often about a, a corn crop. But when we plant corn, we incur all of the costs up front. And we literally have nothing to sell. There is no economic value created, only loss, right? So we have these great accounts that love to, oh, we put all the account, the costs on the balance sheet. And that's like, that's total garbage. Like that is, that is accounting lying. It's not wrong for gap. It's not wrong for tax. I get, and sure. I say lying in air quotes, right? But, it, but it, you don't, if you, if you try to harvest a corn crop 10 days after you planted it, you literally will get $0 for that. Right. If you try to harvest a 120 day corn, 90 days after you've planted it, you will get $0 for it. If you try to harvest that same corn 119 days after you've planted it, you're probably going to get 
you know, zero dollars for it. There is this point where yeah. we sort of step off into the abyss. We've incurred all the expenses and then we wait. And just yeah. like you are saying, we need to make sure we can cover that initial period. And then we also can use that period for development. OK, what mm -hmm. what can we do in that intervening period so that when we get to harvest, now we're prepared for the next phase. Ranching and farming are very seasonal businesses. Accounting, as it turns out, is an insanely seasonal business. <laughs> Nobody wants to really do accounting in the summer. Yeah, no, one, no, no one, that's exactly aren't right. Interested. right? Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but this gives us an opportunity to work on process, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do, how do we get better as a team? But it yeah. also means, just like you're saying, we have to have the cash to do it. I have an onboarding team that is not working at full capacity. That's okay. Right. Because mm -hmm. I'm quite positive that come January, they're going to be overwhelmed. And they know that too, but we've got to be yep. ready. Yeah. Sarah, let's, let's dig into cash reserves. People ask about this a lot of times. I, I do want to draw a bit of a distinction between true cash reserves and borrowed cash reserves. I always mm, want to okay. know the difference there. I, only because I have lived through 2001, 2008, 2020, where we've had sudden weird things that happen with banks, which every now and then restrict people's access to borrowed money, which yeah. I don't want to be a paranoid prepper in any of this, but I also, I always want to have enough cash that if there's some hiccup with my bank or their computer system gets hacked, I am not like out of business in a week, right? Which can yeah. happen. Yeah. But, but I do want to talk more about cash reserves because one of the important things that we see is that very profitable businesses, particularly as they're, aging a little bit, have cash on hand. And we, we get a lot of pushback from our customers while well, interest rates are higher. So why should I be keeping cash? Inflation's high. So right. I need to keep that like, yes and yes. But cash reserves serve a couple of purposes. One is runway, just like you've mentioned already. There's a huge one in my mind that is almost more important, which is insurance. If I have cash in the bank, and, and just think of this, right? How many businesses go broke with a lot of cash in the bank? None. Apple is famous <laughs> as a company that hoards cash. They take yeah. a huge amount of venture capitalist cash, and then they just sit on it. And the VC guys get frustrated with them because like, I gave that to you to go buy XYZ. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. we'll get there. But, but we want to make sure we have enough to get through you know, whatever dark period might possibly be coming. Yeah. I pay money for life insurance. I thoroughly expect to be flushing that money down the drain. If my wife collects the life insurance check, I will not have gotten to where I want to be, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it costs me $100 a month. I am wasting the money, right? In the same way that I'm wasting my car insurance money, right? I don't, I don't want to have an accident, but I want to be covered in case I have one. Keeping cash in the bank costs you money. I get it. You're losing money. You're losing value because of inflation. You possibly are incurring additional interest expense by not, you know, just sort of aggressively paying down all your debt. Mm -hmm. But that reserve gives you resiliency. And it also gives you when, when the crap really hits the fan, which we see in our industry regularly on a 10 year cycle, commodities on about a 10 year average will experience within a six month period, they'll go through about a 70% devaluation. Wow. When that happens, buying opportunities galore, right? Mm. Suddenly we have the ability to buy something at a 70% discount. When that happens, I promise you, you go to the bank, the bank's like, uh, ha, 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 this is bad. Like, I don't know. We're going to have to go talk to Like, you don't want to have to go talk to people. You want cash yeah. so you can go act right now. Uh, yeah. you, there may be a neighboring store, I think of your business, right? That goes, that goes belly up. You might be able to go buy all of their stuff at a, at an 80% discount, right? Like today, if I have cash, yeah. I can go buy the cash registers, the freezers, the displays, I can go get all of it, right? We've all seen those type of fire sales. Uh, and I don't want to sound like I'm a total opportunist there, but there are times if I'm panicked and I need to get out and somebody's willing to give me 20 cents on the dollar, I'm happy to take it because right? yeah. I need yeah. something. That cash reserve, again, puts you in a great place. Uh, we often talk about an inventory triangle, which is you know, feed, cash, and animals. And we have to mm. balance those three things. This, again, goes back to the nuance of your business. How much cash is the right amount? Some of that depends on your industry, your particular business. Some of it depends on yeah. your personality. We have a lot of people, especially young people in business that say, yeah, yeah, I know you want us to have 120 days in cash, but we're only going to run on 30. 
you can get away with that for a little while. But w as soon as you step on a banana peel, you are down the drain. And, and what I would like to see is most of us able to step on a banana peel and experience a hiccup and then not have it wipe us out. Yeah. One of the important things about money, money is incredibly personal. Money is incredibly emotional. And as much as we all like to talk as business owners about like, well, that's business, blah, blah, blah. We also have a tremendous amount of our ego wrapped up in our own success sometimes. And, and I will say that when business goes really badly, there is, there are times of great peril for people, right? That is often followed or accompanied by divorce, drug addiction, suicide, those sorts of things. We take our business in finance and in helping people be successful in their business very seriously, mm -hmm. because when we see the negative consequences of it, especially in multi-generational family businesses, the, yeah. the emotional and sort of interpersonal costs of that failure are so high. So imagine yeah. being the fifth generation rancher and you're the one that loses the ranch. Well, you know, a lot of people feel terrible pressure about that. Yeah. Whether it's justified or not, that's a terrible thing. Now, if you're the fifth generation and turn it from an okay business into an awesome business, well, you're like the hero of your ancestors, right? So, <laughs> so that's a very different position. And, and that's what being good at managing finances can get you in terms of outcome. Yeah. I think what is also like lots of things happening there, right? Like you mentioned the debt versus paying off your debt versus the cash. I'm a huge advocate for kind of pay the minimums on what you need yeah, to for your debt cash. and build up your cash. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. and then, you know, I mean, even personally, you know, as my husband and I were, you know, getting through school and all these different things. And he was like, we got to get rid of the debt. I was like, how about we, how about we sort of do both? Yeah. You know, how about we like put money in the bank and, and go a little above that minimum payment due. And then when we've got at least three months of living expenses, we can kind of go a little bit harder, but, but keep on saving. Right. I, I take that philosophy into business as well, because cash is so important. Yeah. Incredibly important. Cash is king is a cliche for a reason, right? Uh, it totally reason. matters. And, yeah. And I know that you and I have both experienced this in our work as CFOs and 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 certainly me when I step into the controller role, which I do for a number of clients and I'm helping to actually manage their cash flow. It can be a battle to say, I know you've got $50,000 in yep. the bank. I know you've got X number of dollars in the bank and I don't want you to spend any of it. Yep. And, you know, but we could grow, but the, and it's like, yes, you could, but let's keep this here and continue to generate cash and then we can grow. Right. And so it, it is that critical thinking. Are you a seasonal business? What are the expenses how, in ranching? How are things going to change? Right. How much money can you garner for your animal today versus what you'll be able to in, mm -hmm. you know, six months from mm -hmm. now. So that critical thinking, that willingness to go, I know what I need for my business and I'm going to block out these outside, you know, influences and, and recommendations and suggestions and do what I know is right, I think is one of the, the harder things. Of course you want to, you know, look to mentors and talk to other people who, who you trust. But I think those people, if you, if you trust them, they should be looking at your business as a unique one. Yeah. Right. And not just say, well, this is what I do. And this is what you should do too. Right. You know, well, one so, of the cool things about having outside advisors and, and I use you regularly as an example of this is I love entrepreneurs. I love working with entrepreneurs. I'm fairly entrepreneurial myself. What do entrepreneurs lack? breaks, right? They always want to do the next thing. Like, let's do it faster. Yeah. How can we do the next thing? Like you've already got 17 things on your plate. What is wrong with you? Yeah. Right. Through yeah. conversations my wife and I have regularly, right? My <laughs> wife is a bit of the brakes. I'm a bit of the accelerator. You, having someone on your team as an entrepreneur who protects you from yourself while frustrating, I realize mm -hmm. will save you, right? Yeah. Lots of entrepreneurs don't get don't live up to their potential, if you will, or don't get to where yeah. they really want to be. And, and because they don't have an advisor who will be honest with them and say, I think, I think you need to just wait. And teaching yeah. entrepreneurs patience is one of the hardest things. The reasons yeah. they're entrepreneurs is because they don't have those capabilities or ca uh, characteristics, right? Personality traits. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. We just need balance, right? In my marriage, if both of us were the accelerator, we would be a total wreck, right? She's a little bit of the break. I'm a little bit of the accelerator. Sometimes we reverse, but you know, mm -hmm. it's generally a good match. Sometimes my wife is frustrating to me. I am often frustrating to her, but it turns out together there's more value in the team than there is in either one of us. And yeah, that's where, yeah. that's where the ability to partner with businesses and, and, and again, act in a controller role like you do 
provides a tremendous amount of value because one, you see a lot of different situations. Most of us are fairly myopic in what we know about. Uh, and you've been through a few of these before to say, oh, <laughs> this doesn't look exactly like history, but it rhymes. And I have been down yeah. this path before and I'm starting yeah. to get the heebie-jeebies. So let's think about this. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about the importance of recognizing as a founder where you are in these business mm -hmm. cycles, right? Mm -hmm. And this idea of it's not just, oh, you know, I'm pre-launch. I'm in my, my initial growth phase and then I'm plateauing, right? I think we've said it a couple of times now. You're going to circulate through these phases pretty continuously and not that – well, you, you'll even be in the pre-launch phase if you're launching a new product, Absolutely. right? Or if you're looking at launching a new sort of entity or extension of your business, it never really Correct. ends. And so I think an important thing is knowing where am I now? Am mm. I in growth? Mm. Am I in a seasonal dip? Am – you know – and based on that, then knowing what am I focusing on in my financials and what am I focusing on in the economics of my business and, and then being able to, to utilize that information to make some good decisions. I've got a client right now who I keep telling her, it's okay that you're not showing profit on the PL. And she's like, I no, if I go to the bank, I need to have profit. And it's like, you yes, that is true. But you have an amazing cash runway right now. You have a, you, not a huge reserve, mm -hmm. but a great cash runway. Mm -hmm. She's paying down debt. Everything is looking good, like right there. And when that certain amount of debt gets paid off, the reserve is going to start to build. And with that, we can also go to the PL and say, this one little tweak right here, should you choose to do it, will get you profitable mm -hmm. on the PL. So if you're serious about that, here's your, here's your tweak, but guess what? It's related to cash. It's related to spending, <laughs> right? So, so they're, so they're both very connected. And so, you know, it can be tricky to go, wait, I'm not supposed to be looking at the bottom line right now, or you know what I mean? And, and, and kind of knowing where, where you're supposed to be. So think, think about that. And hopefully this podcast helps you figure out kind of where you are and what you should be thinking about. So, so let's get back to your original question with that, which yeah. is, which is more important profit or cash flow? The answer as always is it depends, right? It depends. And, and there's, yep. there's nuance to this, but I think the earlier we are in our business, if we, if we think about a business as having three phases, right, a, a startup phase, and then some sort of intermediate phase, and then like a senescence phase, right? Yep. So Think of, I think of like GM, right? Is like a company that's, yep. you can see the writing on the wall. We're kind of headed out. Uh, but then we've got all these young, you know, take uh, NVIDIA, right? Like they're in that, they're not in the startup phase anymore. NVIDIA has been around for a long time, which most people mm -hmm. don't know. Uh, but they are in serious growth right now, right? Because they've captured a segment of the tech market right now that's in huge demand. So, so you need to know where you are there uh, is one thing. But but also, I'm gonna, I kind of always vacillate or oscillate back and forth between those two. Uh, if profit, I tend to think of as a leading indicator for cash yeah. and gross profit being a leading indicator to profit. So in the very early stage, I'm focused on gross profit because the, I know I'm not going to be profitable in the real world. Yep. So I'm going to kind of ignore it. I'm going to pay attention to it, but I'm, that's not my focus. First focus is getting that gross profit right. We talk about that phase as the get better before you get bigger phase. Yes. Okay? Yes. Because let me say this. If you get bigger when you haven't sorted out that gross mm. profit, guess what? You're going to lose more money, yep, right? right? That growth is not going to help you. Yeah. So I love that you just said that. If you ever need something to research on the internet, look up, get a bigger watermelon truck. There's a great little business peril, parable on there about selling watermelons at a loss. One brother says, oh, well, I guess we just need a bigger truck, you know, and the other brother mm. says, totally idiot. So anyway, it's a good, it's a good little video. It's fun for kids. Okay. So gross profit being that first level of focus, then, then actual profit or net income on your P and L net operating income on your P and L very, very important numbers. We, we again are going to oscillate between those because I believe that operating profit, okay, is actually a predictor of cash flow. Generally I produce value before I can get money from it, right? So if I'm going to sell sunglasses, I got to build the sunglasses first. That's generating economic value that could actually, you know, show positively on the P&L, but then I have to get the money from a customer back into my bank account before I've ever yep. done cash flow. I, I constantly go back and forth between those two. We can, there are a couple of other metrics we can look at. I don't want to get too far into those, 
But then the next, the next and final part is we want to get our cash, our profitability, our gross profit, really good. Our profitability, yeah. what I'll say is good, or also possibly really good. Our yeah. cash flow stable, right? And then at that point, we really focus on balance sheet growth. Now, now let's mm -hmm. grow equity, right? How do we grow right. this business so that it, it can do more work by itself? Uh, I think, it, it, again, you don't get to get to profit if you don't focus on cash flow. You don't get to get to cash flow if you don't focus on profit and gross profit. But yep. just like you're saying at the beginning, you are so starved for cash, you better be focused on it. I, I'll give one quick example here, and, and you've got a number of these too. When we look across the spectrum of ag, dairies tend to be businesses that have very high cash flow. A dairy produces milk every day, and most mm -hmm. dairies work on a system where the milk accumulator, if you will, the people that they sell milk to, send the dairy a check every two weeks. Right. You can be very unprofitable for a very long time if you're receiving cash every week, right? right? Because you can pay your bills. You can keep the lights on. You can keep things going. You might be losing value through depreciation and through unpaid labor and unpaid rent and some of those non-cash type expenses. But because you have cash flow, you're able to pay your feed bill. You're able to pay your mortgage or your rent, right? You're yeah. able to do those things. On the other hand, we see businesses, and this again is a place where we overlap, where we see like birth to plate type direct to consumer meat businesses. So I raise cattle, the calf is born on my place and it is ultimately dies on my place and is sold directly to a customer who eats it knowing where everything's happened. That can yeah. be a 30 month process just to grow the calf to wow. slaughter weight, okay? Then it's another, let's say month, maybe two to get that calf processed into ribeyes and hamburger and you know whatever else. And then it can be another month before I get the check from the customer, right? Or it could right. be multiple months if I'm selling individual cuts and I'm not that good at marketing, right? So now we're talking about, let's say a 40 month cash cycle where I have, it, just like the corn crop, I've incurred all of the costs up front and I haven't seen a single dime positive out of that animal. Well, that could be the most profitable business in the world. You could have a 200% profit margin on that business. And yet I could go out of business in month six because I've run out of money. Yeah. Okay. So, so in that, in that business is cash flow or profit more important? Well, to my mind, it's, it's almost always cash flow. And then we'll yeah. figure out the profit thing. If your cash yeah. flow is bad, often it is because your gross profit or your actual profit is not big enough. So we need to revisit those things with the clear view that when I am growing in the very initial phase, I've got to catch up to my overheads. Oh, yeah. Direct costs grow linearly, overheads grow stepwise. Meaning that to get to a certain, just to produce one unit, I have to pay for a full-time laborer. Well, that full-time laborer might be able to produce a hundred, but I have to get from one to a hundred before I've ever kind of broken even on that. Yep. I love that. And I'm just going to echo something you said earlier is that while profit is an indicator of cash flow in many instances, you have to remember that the debt, that debt service, Absolutely. right? Your taxes, those are not represented on the P&L. Terribly and also they're answer. both important, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it, it's so funny. Uh, I've been on so many podcasts where someone will ask me a question and I'll say, well, you're not going to like this answer <laughs> or your listeners are not going to like this answer because it depends. But I'll die on the sword of if someone is, if an advisor in the world of finance is not telling you, it depends, don't listen to Correct. Them. You know? Yep. Absolutely true. Yeah, I'd love to have you back to talk more about the balance sheet because I think that that is an area of finances where people certainly are like, oh, that's a thing right. that I send to my accountant or that's a thing that if I am looking for money, you know, I have to send to someone. But there, it doesn't get utilized often as a tool in it. understanding what, you know, how the business is going or, or as you were kind of talking about before, how to utilize that balance sheet, yep. you know, uh, to the business's advantage. So I'd love to talk about that. 
Awesome. So thank you for your time today, John, and uh, we'll have you back sometime soon. But oh, before we go, tell folks where they can learn more about Ranch Rikes. We do have farmers and and ranchers who listen to the podcast. You bet. So we have a website, www.ranchrightllc.com, and right is spelled like your right hand. So it's R-A-N-C-H-R-I-G-H-T, L-L-C. We have a monthly webinar that we do. Uh, Those are available on YouTube. We have a Ranch Right YouTube channel. You can also get those through our website. And then we also have a podcast that we have our own podcast, the Ranchonomics podcast and tune in sometime soon to see or hear Sarah on that podcast. We are trying hard to build a business that helps people be successful in business. We, we focus on bookkeeping because that's kind of the backbone of everything. That's where all yep. the data flows from. Uh, and then from there, we launch into whatever we need and are able to do for the business in order to help them be successful. So it has been a lot of fun. We've been in business now for a little over three years, and uh, it it is just continues to be fascinating what we get to see. So I'm naturally kind of a nosy guy, and it's a lot of fun to look at other people's finances because <laughs> I've looked at my own for a long time. That's great. And I have, I have to say that uh, it's been amazing working with you and your team, getting to meet some of those folks and, and work one-on-one with them in the capacity uh, that we are has been really awesome. Super informed, intelligent on top of it, really know your industry. And it's always great to work with a bookkeeping team who, who knows what they're doing because yeah, uh, awesome. it's not Thank always you. the case. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're good. I am, uh, I am crappy at all of that stuff. And so they, they do an incredible job. It really, it has been, it's been a fun adventure getting them together. So it's been good. Great. Sarah, That's thank good. you so much. Appreciate you having me. Yeah. My pleasure, John. See you soon. You can hear more of Sarah's conversation with John by becoming a Bobby Yacht member. When you join, you'll get bonus content from this episode, like why he thinks doubling down on your business is a better strategy to building wealth than investing in the market. So to hear the rest of this conversation, as well as unlock benefits like live coaching and networking events, having your brand highlighted right here on the podcast, and beta testing new tools from The Good Food CFO, become a Bobby Yacht member today by visiting thegoodfoodcfo.com and clicking on membership. Thank you for joining us here today. If you enjoyed this episode or found it helpful or inspiring in any way, please share it with your founder friends on social and rate and review the podcast wherever you listen. It's the number one way to help good food founders find the show. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week.